Saskatchewan. And today I have a special guest uh, who I'm definitely pumped to be talking to today. Matt, if I'm pronouncing it right, Scala. Did I get it right? That's right. All right. And so Matt Scala does have a PhD in computer science and has been a prominent Canadian voice, I'd say, on the internet uh, from my vantage point. But for the listeners who have never heard of you, uh, perhaps those who do not spend all that much time on the internet, how would one describe you best? Let's start with that. All right. Well, I've worn a number of different hats, and for a while recently, I was describing myself as an apostate anchorite starfish. Well, each of those words we can try to put a meaning on, but it may be better to just sort of view it as a, as a gestalt. But I am interested in a lot of things to do with the net and with culture, who introduced me as uh, being involved in computer science, although these days a lot more of what I have to do is uh, related to electronic music. And I write stuff from time to time. I have a weblog that uh, it's not very active these days, although since I have started to withdraw from Facebook, I'm hoping to put more stuff on the weblog. Okay. I have a lot of interesting ideas that I hope are interesting, and I've been kind of watching what's going on in the net in the world for a long time. And so as part of the meeting of the starfish side is the hands in many things and go deeply into different topics, because you have... As you mentioned, it's not just computer science. You've, you've got... I, I, I'd say two two reasons that I, if I had a first sauna, it's a starfish now for two reasons. Yep. On, on TV tropes, which I used to use a lot, I don't really read there anymore, but uh, they talk about starfish aliens who are the aliens who are sufficiently different from humans that it's hard to know what their motivations are. And the other point, of course, is the old story about, well, I saved this one, which isn't even accurate to starfish biology. They'll just crawl into the water if they want to be in the water. But it's still a very interesting and powerful story. And so in terms of the very different from human side, so switch, switching to the human culture side. So one of the things that I've noticed reading your blog and following you over the years is how deeply available Japanese culture has been to you, at least relative to basically everyone else in the English-speaking world that I followed. And so you've noticed at least once or twice these differences between the Western and internet culture and the Japanese culture in terms of how they see the world. As kind of mentioned at the beginning before we went live, I guess, is there anything like that going on today where there's something where perhaps it seems uh, obvious on the Japanese side and obvious on our side where the obviousness isn't mentioned? Well, I don't want to put myself forward as really an expert on Japan. You know, I've been studying the language for years and I still can barely speak or read anything and it's hard. But 
it's certainly my impression that just questions of what's important are very different. Now, you mentioned some, when we were speaking earlier some of the stuff on the Fediverse. I don't know if you want to go into that right now or try to think of new things. I read an interesting article just today which suggested that some of the U.S. allies in Asia are looking with horror at the current um, electoral situation because they are worried that the new government, who might be much better from a European or North American or even Canadian point of view, uh, may not actually have the interests that they thought were important at heart, uh, specifically in the relation between the USA and China. Right. So I've definitely encountered people who are part of the diaspora from Thailand and Vietnam and a couple of the satellite countries around China that are becoming increasingly dominated by the Chinese government. Is this more along that line or is there another yes, and kind of fashion? I mean, I can at some point dig out the, the link for you that I, that I actually saw on Twitter, but the concern is that under President Trump, if we can mention that name, there was actually a lot of engagement with the Japanese government, Abe, golfing with Trump any number of times and so on, and was really consulted. Whereas the view now may be, especially with some of the people who are looking like they may be appointees in dealing with China, there may be a withdrawal from that, that the USA may not really pay much attention to its allies in East Asia in the interests of just going for very specific points that are not actually so important, such as human rights. I mean, this may be horrifying, but so the people in China, in Japan don't really care all that much about the Chinese human rights situation. And if Biden is going to make that the centerpiece of his China policy and stop listening to the other points that they do care about, that may be a concern. So on the other points that they do care about, side, because this isn't something available as much, do you know of any of the other points that are more salient, perhaps? Uh, economic uh, cooperation and trade, the, the, those very simple sort of bread and butter types of issues, as well as the military security of the whole region. Again, I'm to some extent just parroting some of the commentators I read who, in English who look very much at these points, but there's a whole sort of chain of dominoes along the uh, South China Sea that if the first one falls, then the next one does. And if the USA isn't really paying close attention to that, it's an issue. Similarly, there's a lot of concern expressed by some US commentators that Taiwan doesn't really have the will to maintain a military that is functional. Mm. And they are looking at buying lots of expensive hardware rather than the basics of, well, let's actually have our conscripts learn how to be soldiers. Not really what they need to do. And the USA is not supporting them in making the decision decisions they need to make. Interesting. And more on that side, the as far as the situation with Japan and China running up to the election, because there were so many things going on here that perhaps would have blinded us to movement along both in the South China Sea and elsewhere. Is there any movement on that or anything kind of well, to know about there? Or? I don't know a lot about the prospective nominees for the State Department and the other agencies in the States. Okay. My impression is that some of them are more in the direction of the Obama appointees, who again, may be really focusing on the issues that are important at home in the USA and that are important to Europe. And if Asia then gets sort of shuffled down on the priority list, that may be a concern because, of course, you do have a very large power in Asia who are not sitting on their hands. They are actually thinking about where they want to take the world. So in terms of where the world is being taken, and especially in light of both the blue and red team in the States, and then kind yeah, of the now broader... Yeah, of course, those points, the, these issues that the USA is focusing on are really of more interest to me, too. So I can say more about them. I okay. Think. So where the blue and the red team are clashing and are kind of seeing one thing that's obvious on their side and one thing that's obvious on the red side where they're seeing past each other. Do you have any examples off the top of your head that are sticking out? I think possibly the biggest thing thing is that each side doesn't really, and this is probably more of a problem for the blue, but it's a problem on both, each side doesn't really take the other side seriously. I heard in the few days after the election a whole lot of talk about, well, why were the polls so wrong? Why did Nate Silver make such a bad prediction? And I don't think he did. I, the result was pretty much in line with what he predicted. But I realized that, okay, the headline number on Nate Silver's 538 election page was the prospective chance of Donald Trump or Joe Biden winning. Mm. 
And at the time of the election, he was saying it was 10% Trump, 90% Biden. I think a whole lot of people were looking at that and really believing that it meant 10% of the votes, votes to yeah. Trump and 90% of votes to Biden. And then, and so on, then on top of that, there's also like the question of the result of the election versus the way the election results have been portrayed by the media sure. since. You know, right? the, the actual result was about 48%, 52%, which is well within the range of what Silver predicted. Exactly. But it wasn't 10, 90, and someone who thought it should be then said, oh, the prediction is wrong. And so in terms of the not taking each other seriously, one of the things that I think has led from that is the view of when one side is wrong about something, that it's getting harder and harder for that to be corrected internally, because the one of the things that keeps us honest is the other side poking at us in the right way. But once we start auto-blocking so much of the things that we disagree with, it seems like that we're losing a little bit of that ability Sure, there's this whole all or nothing thing that at one time in politics throughout the, what you might call a free world, we still had some respect for each other. You know, someone can be wrong without being an evil person. But now, and, and I would certainly attribute this to the misinterpretation of postmodernism, there is so much tie between identity and ideas. We can't talk about an idea without talking about the identity of a person who holds that idea. And then that makes it very difficult to say that an idea is wrong without also saying and believing that the person who got that idea is a complete write-off. And having just read your pandemic, The Reckoning Post, this idea of basically going down the list of things that are decisions that were made that have consequences. Like, for example, people who build a social expectation or where other people can't wear a mask due to these social expectations in their particular in-groups. And then vice versa, people who build the expectation that you have to wear a mask and then there's a non-zero number of people who, for physical and disability reasons, really can't. And so, like, on both sides, there's this kind of tabulation of expected consequences that will be paid. And then, the, if I'm interpreting the essay correctly, is that the total sum of benefits, punishments, etc., is not going to be paid unless we kind of force it. People for thousands of years have been expecting life to be fair. Right. And when we see that life manifestly is not fair, then we have to come up with some way to believe that it would be fair, which often ends up being pushed into an afterlife. And the rhetoric I've been hearing, in, especially in the first few months of the pandemic, was sort of pushing it into the afterlife of after the pandemic, yeah. then everything will be sorted out. We will count up the totals and figure out who was wrong and the righteous will be rewarded and the unrighteous will be punished. And it seems pretty clear that that's not going to happen. And especially in situations like, for example, with our federal government right now, talking mm -hmm. about budgeting in a post-pandemic economy as if we've right. already dealt with the pandemic and it isn't exploding in numbers all around us right now, especially here local to me and at least looking at the numbers local to you as well. Sure. Um, and so like this idea that we can like keep pushing the consequences just that little further over the boundary of after this pandemic, after this is all done. Well, there's also the whole expectation of things to be fair. I, there was a, a great quote I saw from someone that said, well, you know, we, and he was being facetious about it, but other people say this seriously, we are very tired of this, so it must be factually over by now. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, that's not how it works. And if when you do that, especially with something that is exponentially growing, if you say, well, we've paid our share, now we don't have to keep doing this, and it's not over and it starts growing again, then you are also throwing away all the sacrifices you already made. Exactly. And, and I mean, there is something to be said for the sunk cost fallacy. But at the same time, this idea of this issue of being able to tie the fairness, this idea of future fairness and how we're going to eventually get to that fair outcome, to identity. One of the things that has changed in terms of how we do that is this presence of, especially in a, a lot of our social interactions, of this like third person Facebook. I, I, I don't know exactly how to like point to it in a grammatical sense almost, but like where both sides can easily report the other's true or false claims if they run across their, their dogma or their, their sentiments. But yeah, there's an interesting question of sort of how public are interactions. The line randos in my mentions, 
right? You and I may have a conversation on the Fediverse or wherever, and then somebody comments that we weren't expecting. And to what extent is that a good thing? To what extent is a bad thing? Well, when everybody is performing for the my side good, other side bad, you know, whatever else, we see this especially on some of the, the social networks where it's important with every utterance to show which side you're on. Hmm. Two people can have a conversation and they understand what the terms of reference are. And I can say something that I maybe don't believe, but I'm just testing the waters and you can understand that. But somebody else sees it and thinks it's an absolute black and white truth or sees a joke as, as a serious comment or vice versa. It quickly spirals out of control when then they also bring their posse. Right. And in this context, the bringing of the posse is an attempt at making something of a fair situation out of it, right? Where you see, like, the person who's doing something sure, wrong. Sure, they shouldn't be allowed to do that. Yeah. And when our bubbles are so narrow, because we've already blocked almost everybody we don't like, there may be a, a very hard-to-understand concept of scale. I see something and I don't realize that... That's a view that's seriously held by 48% of the population. Right. I think, oh, I'm dealing with someone who's on the fringe, and my view is 98%. And this means things can easily spiral out of control. And that reminds me of, like, in the privacy context, where, like, people will, for example, share naked pictures of themselves with their significant other. Like, again, thinking that it's, like, a, a normal thing, which basically it is in the modern era, without the context of, like, this can be shared a second time. Right, especially for younger people, that there's this missing context of how big things can escalate very quickly. Well, uh, maybe, but then there's also the sort of ham-fisted attempts to solve that problem with artificial limits. You know, some of these social networks have built-in limits. Oh, you can't reshare something, or oh, you can only reshare it through three steps or whatever. And because those limits are opaque, people can't build an accurate mental model of what's actually happening. Now, I don't think that there's any 16-year-old today who fails to understand that a photo they share can be shared further. I think there may be some misunderstanding of how much can people trust each other, which is a mistake 16-year-olds have been making for many centuries. Yeah. More on the, the side of the mental model side, where like, there's the concept of, yes, they can share it, but what is the total sum damage of from my reputation, my social reputation of someone sharing that image? Same thing sure. with the, the political side. And there's a, an issue that we see this on the Fediverse too with regard to instance size. I don't think people have any concept of power law distributions. Yeah. You know, I have maybe 100 followers. Most of my friends have about 100 followers. A few have a thousand followers, and maybe I know like one person who has a hundred thousand followers. <laughs> and the, the dynamics of sharing an image are similar to that. I share it with one person, probably it's not going any further. Maybe there's a 10% chance it goes to 10. And maybe there's a tiny chance it's like winning the lottery that it's going to be a million people. That it's really hard to understand those small chances of big events. I mentioned winning the lottery. That's the classic example. Right. Pandemics, well, of course, being kind of another People one, right? don't intuitively yeah. understand the case for buying a lottery ticket involves multiplying a small number by a large number and comparing that against another number of similar magnitude. And people can do that. And I do buy lottery tickets from time to time myself, not very often, because there are also other considerations involved too. Right. So people, again, this is something that the internet makes faster, but it doesn't, it's not a new thing. People have been having trouble understanding large numbers multiplied by small numbers for a long time. And going back to the idea of fairness and identity, where like we want the world to be a fair place and we want the, the people in the out group to behave in a way that makes the, the world fairer. And we're, we're tying our identity to this concept of fairness. Now, is there, in terms of perhaps even in your own, how you see yourself in your own identity, do you see that in terms of th this kind of choice of fairness? And do you find, do you catch yourself doing that sort of thing? Or is that more of a seeing it in other people, not so much? Well, I, I notice myself doing that sort of thing. I wouldn't say I catch myself because I don't, I try not to uh, disown any of my own natural uh, tendencies and feelings. I certainly, I want things to be fair. And I experience a lot of things that I think are unfair. And so it doesn't surprise me that other people also go through exactly that same experience. But I also don't think that I can realistically expect things to become fair just because I say they should. 
Right. And Terry Crouchett, who wrote a whole lot of important things about life and, and people, wrote that there's no justice, there's just us. And that is something I mentioned also in that blog piece that you mentioned. If there's going to be any reckoning, we have to do it. Now, we better think carefully because we're going to be on the receiving end of that reckoning too. But to the extent that there is any fairness that can be created, we have to take some responsibility to do that. And that also kind of echoes a similar sentiment that Julian Assange made in the Occupy this day, what was it, this day with Assange or something like that? Did you ever see that particular interview? I, I didn't read much of that, no. Yeah, it was basically like when Occupy Wall Street was going on, somehow he squirreled the people from Arab Spring, the Occupy Wall Street, a couple of the Occupy Europe's, the organizers, into a bank within London while he was still under house arrest, somehow mm -hmm. got himself out of the Ecuadorian embassy into this hideout within the bank itself and then tried to figure a way that the occupiers had to to enforce their idea and and he was kind of curious about like okay you have all these ideas of fairness now how do we enforce it like what are your enforcers going to do when people come in and cause problems when the cops drop someone in who is just going to you know be drunk and sexually harass people in the, in your camp etc cetera, etc cetera. now in terms of the fetters and in terms of your experience over the m many years from live journal and to Facebook, to the Fediverse and onward. Do you see in the world of social media, is there any mistakes that we keep making in terms of both that and more broadly? Okay, uh, maybe I can take that in a funny direction and link okay, it to Gödel's theorem, which you've probably, you're probably aware of, the incompleteness theorem in logic. I think it may not be possible to codify a set of axioms for good behavior. And so if you try to make a list of this is what we will allow and this is what we will not allow, inevitably it's not going to work. Now, do, are you in fact familiar with Bodle's theorem? A little bit, yeah. Yeah, okay. So, and do you think that our listeners are? Probably not, but... All right. So the point is, if you, make a, if you make a list of axioms mathematically and you try to deduce everything else or, or induce them from those axioms there are going to be holes. There are going to be statements that are true in your logical system, but you can't prove them. And so you end up having to introduce additional axioms, and there's no end to it. And this can be linked to issues of, for me in theoretical comp sci, of uncomputability, that there are programs that cannot answer questions about other programs. Now, it's probably impossible to formalize this in a way that you could apply to human relations, but it does seem to be intuitively true that if you try to write down a list of everything that people are allowed to do and everything they're not allowed to do, you will end up with cases that you can't handle by those rules that you wrote. And this is something that leads to problems in the Fediverse and in open source development where people want to have a code of conduct. And someone who writes a code of conduct, if they're serious about it, it'll end up being rather vague. And then people who love rules lawyering, and there are plenty of those on the Fediverse and even more so in software development, are going to say, oh, but what about this case that's not covered? Or they do something that's out of line, and then they say, but that wasn't specifically mentioned in the list. Right. Contrary-wise, the list, because it was so vague, will end up getting applied to behavior that it shouldn't be. And that's often an even bigger problem. And My point of view is that often then it's best not to try to axiomatize this in, in the first place, but there are other views too. So am I kind of interpreting correctly? Because you, in one of your posts, and I can't remember which one, you described like a difference between like the dark blue team or the side of the blue team and the light side of the blue team. Do Am I interpreting correctly? Like, is that the difference between those who have their rules and then strictly enforce the rules. Yeah, I think the one you're talking about is my Mastodon timeline. Yeah. And I didn't really have anything that formal in mind okay. with that distinction. I was just sort of saying, well, there are some people who moved into Mastodon and started creating instances, and they called it Mastodon, not Fediverse. Yeah. And they were all about pushing their politics. There were others who maybe had some sympathy with that, but were not. that wasn't their main reason for being there. That okay. would be more of the dark blue versus light blue distinction that I would that I would see. But that's not a hard distinction. It's not yeah. like those are two teams and you can know which one someone is. It's more to sort of, well, there are different degrees of affiliation. Right. And uh, you mentioned that there was a particular case this week of a company that wasn't uh, particularly fair or okay, uh, okay. accurate. In yeah, the dark blue versus light blue. Yeah. That's, that's a great segue to something completely, completely different, which is that, okay, so my I make a living trying to sell, uh, or I try to make a living selling electronic musical instruments. 
and I sell synthesizer modules. You fit them into a rack system and you pl plug them together and they make noise. And so each of my modules has a front panel and I contract with a, a company that's uh, based in Ireland, but their factories in Germany to manufacture the front panels. So I just on Friday got a batch of panels from them and they were the wrong color. They were supposed to be medium blue and the <laughs> medium blue parts of it were really dark. Now this has nothing to do with politics. I'm sure it was just a mistake operating the machine. Right. But yes, then, then I have to write to them. It, by the time I discovered this, it was already after closing time on Friday in Ireland. So I don't expect to get a response until Monday. And I don't expect it to be a huge problem. I mean, I may end up accepting these in exchange for a discount or I may ship them back and ask for them to do it right. These people are pretty good with customer service. I'm sure we can sort it out. So I'm not too worried about it, but it was a bit horrifying to open the box and see, oh no, these are panels that I don't think I can use. But uh, it's interesting though, because this idea of like, they probably were just using the machine incorrectly, right? That, that we well, can I'm like- Well, I'm sure like yeah. that because this is like all computer-aided manufacturing. I send them a file that describes the panel and they run it into their machine. I'm sure that there's a fair bit of skill involved in getting a machine to really do its job, but there's nothing different between this batch and the good batch I got a couple months ago. So I think there's probably some fairly minor change in how the machine was operated. Right. And in the same way, like we are operating this computer aided social reputation manufacturing machine that is Facebook, the Fediverse, Twitter, etc. Each individual person, it does take some skill after a while. Like if you take a, a right. normal and person to like that is, harmed. Yeah. that is harmed by not having a good mental model. People talk about the algorithm and the algorithm is so bad and other people say, oh, but it shows you the things that you want. Well, the trouble is you can't really know how the algorithm works. If the algorithm is something simple like show everything I subscribe to in reverse chronological order. Mm -hmm. That's great because I can understand it. Even if it's a little bit more complicated, even if it's something like don't show things that contain this keyword, do show things that contain that keyword. Okay, I can work with that. But when it's a huge black box, possibly run by neural nets, which nobody consciously understands. And, and possibly even including mentions of itself. Right? It's and not unthinkable that at this point not. that like and Facebook rewards also, those that re reward it by talking positively about it. For sure. And knowing that to the extent anybody has human control or understanding of these algorithms, it's being run for purposes that I don't approve of, hmm. including to manipulate me. That really raises <laughs> a lot of concern. It's not the fact that there is a relatively complicated algorithm, it's the lack of transparency. Right. But do you also see though that the even if there was a transparency transparency there, that after a certain level of complexity that it would flip to being irrelevant whether there was transparency or not? Well, when it's something like a neural net, we're already well past that. Yeah. Because all we can say is, here's a large a matrix multiply operation, and we put this in and that comes out. It's like we see this large in number multiplied by small number, only like scaled up by like a grid, right? Sure, you know. And we see this in some of the concerns over stuff like image classifiers. There was yeah. a famous case where they looked at a picture of a human and it said monkey. Well, if it looked at a picture of a sheep and it said goat, we would say, oh, it's doing very well. But a human and a gorilla are actually much closer to that. The only reason it was a big problem was because we have a whole lot of additional human expectations about what it means when you confuse a human with a monkey in particular. Mm -hmm. And so we're inferring a whole lot of extra intelligence onto the algorithm when really, although it's opaque, it's still a very stupid thing. Right. This is something that uh, Terry Pratchett again wrote about in one of his few nonfiction books, the idea that minds tend to sort of infer or even create images of minds in other systems. You can give a mantis shrimp a box with a rubber band around it and it'll figure out how to open it, and that's cool. A shrimp is pretty smart for an invertebrate, but if you give your shrimp puzzles like that, then a while later you just give it a box with a shrimp in a piece of a small shrimp that it'll eat without a rubber band, you can feel that it looks disappointed. <laughs> You're inferring that, and is it true that the mantis shrimp is smart enough to have enjoyed those puzzles? Maybe. Or maybe that's just sort of something that we create. And I've seen similar suggestions in terms of higher level animals, dogs, that we put our emotions onto them to a large extent. I mean, I yeah. personally, in my experience with dogs, I find them to have a, a lot of, maybe not human level emotions, but very, very high level emotions to be to, uh, observed. But. Sure. In my book, Shining Path, I, I'm probably more interested in cats than in dogs. And 
I've tried, there, there are a whole lot of characters who are what I call Jonico, which basically means cat girls. I tried to make them a lot more like cats than like girls. Okay. okay? Because we think we understand humans, but a cat is really alien. And cats are actually pretty close to us. I mean, they're mammals. They have a whole lot of the re same responses we do. And yet, the cat walks into the room and you don't know what they're going to do or why. To what extent can we find that cats are almost starfish? And actual starfish are a lot further away still. So it's good that you brought that book up because you released this book at the beginning of the pandemic. It's like a for the rest of us to read during the pandemic. But, sure. But talk, I mean, talk a little bit about it because it looks like an awesome read, although I haven't gotten into it yet. So for our right. listeners, what is this book about? And um... Okay. When I first started writing this, which was about 13 years ago, I called it Cargo uh, as my sort of working title. And I had in mind that it was about cargo cults. The cargo cult thinking, not just specifically on the Pacific Islands, but the thinking that if you build it, they will come, that you should be able to achieve what you want by creating the conditions for it to occur, and then it will just magically happen. Now, in the years that I spent writing that sort of on the side while I was doing other things, it developed into other ideas. I get the manuscript finished in 2010. I was watching a lot of what we now call the culture war, and I put a lot of that into the book. But it's important to understand that in 2010, I don't know how many people really consciously remember what the culture war was like in 2010. It wasn't called the culture war then. And a lot of the developments that we have seen since have not occurred. So there's a lot of alternate history and that to some extent it's an alternate future history. I can't say that I predicted the way things would go. And since I didn't really, it's not quite as exciting to read it in 2010 as it would have been if I'd said, oh yes, this is if I'd actually known exactly what was happening. But there's a lot of those concepts. I mean, you mentioned earlier Assange talking about Occupy. What was Occupy trying to accomplish? How would they really deal with it? There's some of that kind of thing going on near the end of the book. Occupy was a floating signifier. I think many people involved in it didn't really know what they were fighting for. They just knew they had to fight for something. Hmm. There are groups in the book that are doing something similar. And especially it's, once they tried to formalize it, right? And then the different rules came out, and of course many of them were incompatible. So like it got stuck at that point. Sure, and yeah. a movement like that, anybody who does have a formalized idea of what they want to achieve, is going to try to co-opt it. And there may be more than one such group. I don't know enough about Occupy to say whether that was what happened there, but it was certainly something that happened in what I call the sailor suit riots in the Shining Path, that there were at least three groups who each had a very important idea for themselves about how they wanted to change the world, and then they each tried to sort of co-opt the others to do that. <laughs> And so you've got The Shining Path, and you've got another book, uh, Chestoku, which is a yeah. mixture between Sudoku and chess puzzles, yes. logic puzzles. Now that you've at least published online The Shining Path, you've got your business selling your synthesizer equipment, etc., etc. Given how many different pots you've had on the stove in the past, I'm imagining this isn't the last we've heard of you. Is there anything that you've been well, working on lately? I certainly hope not. I mean, each of these things has sort of a different purpose and a different frame. Chesujoku was, oh, here's a fun thing. I like playing with constraint logic programming. Let's see what I can do with it. And that was never really designed to make money or anything like that. Shining Path, I was hoping could lead to some sort of career in writing science fiction fantasy type things, although I ended up finding that I sort of had to choose between that and the, the other career direction I was looking at at the time, which was academic. North Coast Synthesis, the synthesizer modules are basically designed to put bread on the table, and I am fortunate that in the last few months I've actually been able to do that. Up until then, I've basically been paying for the privilege of running my business, and now I have for a couple months actually paid rent using money from the company, which is great. Congrats. Of course, I always have other projects. I am hoping to ramp up postings on my personal weblog in the next little while. I have for a long time been working on a Japanese language font family that I haven't had much time to work on recently, but it's not dead. I'm still occasionally designing another character or two and posting them in there. So I don't know what's next after that. Right on. And I guess as we're slowly getting nearer to the end of the show, one thing I noticed, I'm not sure if 
you quite caught it at the time based on the, the particular thread, but the, in your what color are those bits article on the DRM copyright and or computability theory, etc. One of the comments seemed like it was from Terry Davis. And I'm just yeah, wondering I if I saw that, that you yeah. mentioned that. At the time I got that comment, I didn't know who he was. I since found out. But my point of view is that he doesn't really seem a whole lot different to me from the kinds of kooks we used to get on Usenet. There were a lot of them. And so when I saw that comment come through on the weblog, I didn't think, oh, wow, I got a comment from Terry Davis because... Well, yeah, it was years you know, before yeah, he would be known it at all, right? Sure. Yeah. Now, I don't even remember what he said, so I guess I'd have to go back to see that to, yeah. to comment further on it. But, uh, <laughs> Yeah. Back in those Usenet days, is there anything from those days that is still salient that perhaps a lesson that the younger programmers who didn't get to experience the Usenet might be able to pull from you? I think largely just the same kinds of things that we've been talking about of being able to separate an individual from the ideas. You know, Terry Davis has certainly written some interesting code despite being a kook. Hmm. And on Talk to Bazaar, I remember we had really some what they you know, in Alice's Restaurant, they call mean and nasty, ugly people on there who were still writing things that were fun to read. There was, in those days, much more concept of someone can have a identity and they can have participation online, and those two things don't need to be mixed. And it was a great time for anybody who was, as they say, on the spectrum, and we're no longer in those days now. All right, so, and as we come to a close, is there any last word that you'd like to get across to the world that's listening, perhaps? Uh, not really. Stay safe, everybody. That's about it. All right, well, uh, for those of you still listening, definitely go out and read The Shining Path and buy at least one of the books that Matt has written, because so much uh, knowledge is contained within your head. So, and for the rest of you, just as a reminder, there is a subscribe, star.com slash Jeff Dashcliffe, that you can use to support this show specifically. And with that, I will uh, head out for the week, and hopefully I will see you all next week.